Well, thank you so much, everybody, for putting up with my uh, rambles just for a little moment there. And I'm really, really delighted to see so many lovely faces, so many people I recognise and and others new to me as well. Um, so my name, if you don't know me, is Jessie Wilde and I'm the Deputy Director of the Bristol Housing Festival. and We are helping to host this event for you this evening. There are lots and lots of other people that have been absolutely essential to the organisation of this event, including the All Churches Trust. Um, and we just want to say a massive thank you to everybody who has been involved. For those of you that missed me when I was saying it, um, this is going to be recorded um, and it is being uh, streamed live on YouTube as we speak. So do feel free to keep your video off and keep yourself muted if, if you're not comfortable with being recorded or seen on YouTube. But I am really excited about this event because as part of the Archbishop of Canterbury's Commission on Housing Church Community, this Innovative Built Solutions for Churches programme was created to assist churches in responding effectively and creatively to the housing crisis. So over the last 12 months, LiveShare, who we'll hear from later, have been working with seven different churches, three of which we're going to hear from in a few moments, um, to support them on their journey to create affordable homes um, and often improving community spaces and, and creatively using their land and assets. So this evening, um, we are going to hear from the Bishop of Kensington, the Right Reverend Dr. Graham Tomlin. We're going to hear from Marvin Rees, the Mayor of Bristol. We're going to hear from Rebecca Stockman, who's from Live Share, and then also some of the participating church leaders that have been part of this. And I won't steal their stories. I'm going to let them do all the introductions themselves. But hopefully this will give us a chance as well to challenge us about thinking through what steps we might be able to take um, to make something happen in our own communities. So this evening, this whole event is gonna be an hour and a half. We're gonna hear from the panel first, and then we're gonna move into a panel discussion and Q and A. Um, you will notice that you can't unmute yourselves. That is deliberate, forgive us, um, but please do, if you have any questions, pop them in the, in the chat box. Um, and then uh, Jesse Carter, who you may be able to find somewhere on this big screen, um, will be collating those questions and sending them over to me so I can put them to the, to the panel. So we have already received some questions um, ahead of time. So do feel free to add your questions to the box. And if we can't get to your question, do forgive us, but we will get through as many questions as possible. Then as we hit kind of eight o'clock, I'm going to formally close this, this session, um, this section all, all together like this. And then there's going to be an opportunity for breakout rooms where there's, it's a chance to chat informally really with, with other people that are on this call um, to, to start to have a conversation about what, what we can do and start to reflect on some of the things that we've heard here. Each of those breakout rooms is going to have a representative from either a church that's involved in the um, Innovative Build Solutions programme or from someone you've seen on the panel. And we'd really encourage you to stick around for these breakout rooms to have part of that conversation. Um, and then you will be able to leave the meeting from those breakout rooms. So I'm going to formally close it around about eight-ish and then move us into break, breakout rooms. When you finish in the, in the room, you can just leave from there. So don't forget, I'm about to introduce the panel, but don't forget, as you're hearing from each of the panel members, please do pop your questions in the box as we go. Now, I'm not going to um, speak for much longer, I promise, um, and I'm going to try not to get involved in between each of the panellists uh, introducing themselves. I'm going to just let that run through. We're going to start with um, the Right Reverend Dr. Graham Tomlin, move on to Mayor Marvin Rees, then hear from Rebecca Stockman, followed by Rowena Paling, Andrew Stansbury, and Bill Bewley. So without much further ado, may I hand over to Graham Tomlin. Thanks, Jesse, very much indeed, and very good to see you all tonight. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Graham Tomlin. I'm the Bishop of Kensington in London, uh, but I actually, I'm actually from Bristol. Uh, I was born and brought up in Bristol. I'm a proper Bristolian. Uh, you can hear it a little bit in my voice. Still got a little bit of the Bristol accent, but um, well, most of it's been lost, but uh, there you go. Anyway, it's very good to be with you tonight. I got involved in housing because, um, because basically because the Grenfell Tower fire happened in one of the parishes that I'm responsible for. And uh, I was involved on the day and uh, in the aftermath of um, the fire and ever since then have become quite interested in housing. And as a result of that, I was asked to be the vice chair of the Archbishop of Canterbury's uh, commission on housing, church and community, which has been a great privilege to be involved in that over the last couple of years. And just in these couple of minutes at the beginning, uh, I would like to say something about why, why the church should be involved in housing. Uh, you might be interested in this little booklet that we just brought out. It's a great booklet called Why, why the Church 
uh, should care about housing. Uh, that might be a way to pick it up. But just to kind of summarize some of those things, why should the church care about housing? Three very quick reasons. One, because home is a basic human need. There are some issues in society that affect some people, but not others. But home affects absolutely everybody. Uh, all of us, pretty well all of us, have some kind of place we call home, whether it's a mansion or whether it's a flat or something in between. And having a home is about basic human dignity. And if it matters to us, surely it matters to God. And if it matters to God, it matters to his church. The second reason is because, actually, when you think about it, the, the Christian story uh, is about home. If you actually think about the story of the Bible, it's the story of, our, of the human race being given a home to live in, a garden uh, in which they could live. But it's then the story of the abuse of that garden and the abuse of the relationship with, with God who gave it and the human race being cast out of that garden, becoming homeless, as it were, out into a hostile world. But then it's the story of the long journey back home again. Uh, through the history of Israel, the coming of Christ at the heart of that story. And right at the end of the Bible, we get that amazing verse in Revelation 21. See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. He will, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. Now, that story, as we understand it in the commission, we've translated that into five key values as to what good homes are about. And we say they are sustainable, uh, they're safe, they're stable, they're sociable, and they're satisfying. Now we can unpack those a little bit later on if you like, but that's our framework that maps onto that Christian story. So the gospel is about home, and there is a way, it seems to me, of, of telling, you know, good homes tell the story of the gospel in bricks and mortar. And then one last point, good ho housing builds community, because home is about having a stake in the society that you're part of. It means you can make a contribution to your community. In other words, good housing that is sustainable, safe, stable, sociable, satisfying, enables you to play your part in a, in, in a community and enables good social engagement. So there's my three reasons for why uh, church, the church should be interested in housing, because it's a basic human need, because the gospel is all about home and, uh, and house. And then lastly, good housing builds community. Thank you. <clears throat> and... Uh... Um, you know, I, I have been real honoured to be part of the um, the commission, and and I'll just share uh, three reflections. Uh, why housing? Um, since getting elected, uh, well, before getting elected, we identified housing as the key policy tool uh, for the city. Many of the services we end up spending money on and time on uh, happen because people haven't had good, stable homes in the first years of their lives, affordable homes in mixed, balanced uh, communities. And it goes on from what uh, Graham has just said, but, you know, it, it's not just the house, it's not just the unit, it is about how we, how we create the conditions in which communities and human relationships can form. And we've seen through COVID actually, the weakness, some of the weaknesses in our society exposed, and those have been about pre-existing health conditions, overcrowded housing, social isolation, and, and building quality homes in communities is one of the ways we can build uh, resilience into the future of our communities shopping trips for example by neighbors so you know you don't you we need a city system to to supply people with food but when neighbors are shopping for neighbors we begin to build that strength into in, into our communities that makes for strong uh, uh, societies that are both just and which goes with it cheaper to run to be perfectly frank as well Secondly, um, housing is, is key, not only to those individual uh, and community level justice issues, but global justice. One of the things I've pointed out to some of the kind of activist community in the city is that the kind of homes we build and where we build them will be one of the biggest determinants of the price the planet has to pay for our rapid urbanization. Cities are growing, you can't, that's just gonna happen. The world population is growing, people are moving to cities. Bristol is, is at about 465,000. We anticipate the city growing by over 90,000 in the next 25 years. That's just gonna happen. We have a housing crisis today. We have to build homes for those people in the future. Build, not building homes is not an option, but we clearly wanna build homes that in and of themselves are zero carbon, smart, um, do not require m masses of energy. And we have to build them in locations that allow for active travel. If we build them six, seven miles away from any employment zones or retail offer, people will be dependent on fossil, you know, uh, transport systems. So we have to redesign our cities, the right kind of homes in the right places. It will be key to so many of our other social challenges. 
The third point I make is, and I'm really pleased and we took this challenge on early on the commission, was that this cannot just be about people ragging on government, you know, and, and ragging on public authorities to get it done. I think there's a real weak version of activism that says, I'm an activist if I just tell everyone how bad the world is. Particularly for the church, if you're gonna point out what the problem is, the fullness of the prophetic position is also to put a solution, right? Joseph did that, many of the prophets did it, right? <laughs> so I, I, I think the fact that this is about uh, the framework, the way the country works, but it's also about the church saying, oh, actually we have land and we have resource, what's our part in um, a, a delivery? Because if I'm a Christian, but I would deliver the chance, any, deliver the challenge anyway. If I'm lobbied by the church, one of my first points is, well, how did you do it? Right? You got the Holy Spirit. You got supernatural power. Show me what you did to solve these major global crises at the moment, and then please enlighten me. <laughs> but um, if you haven't solved it, then you know there's a there's a challenge about how we come alongside leaders to be part of the solution as well. Thanks, Marvin. Uh, so I'm Rebecca. It's really good to be here. I'm from Livshire. Um, last year, we worked with seven churches across the country. So Bromley, Bristol, Blackburn, Croydon, Cornwall and Warsaw, to be specific. Um, the work was funded by the All Churches Trust and um, commissioned by the Commission. Um, we provided support and guidance to churches over last year um, as they took action to create homes using their land and assets. So what that looked like practically was things like vision workshops, writing community. Uh, communication strategies, options reports and partnership agreements. Um, alongside that we wrote a guide for others that's online now hosted by uh, Housing Justice alongside some case studies from the churches as well as other churches that have also created housing. Um, our key learning points I think from this really were um, the need to take small steps um, development can be easily overwhelming and I think there's a need to break it down to li little bits that are possible. Um, the need to reach out, connect with communities, speak to each other and not think you've got it all sorted. I think it's really helpful and you get the best solutions like that. Um, and the last one was maintaining a flexible focus. So being clear about what you want to get to, but not too fussed about the route um, and not getting too hung up on the process. But um, yeah, keeping an eye on the goal, really. Um, and that's it from me. So I'll pass over to Rowena. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm Rowena and I'm representing one of the churches uh, which has been working with LiveShare. And we've been really grateful for the support that we've received. I'm the Vice Dean of Blackburn Cathedral, which is in Lancashire in the northwest of England. And uh, we're committed very much here at the cathedral to using all of our buildings creatively. So actually at the moment, our crypt is a COVID vaccination centre. And it's always been part of the story of the cathedral, just as um, Bishop Graham said, it's been part of the story of, of the church and the people of faith. Um, it's been part of our story here at the cathedral to use our buildings and for our position, for our buildings to be situated in the heart of a community for, for their use. But I think that our specific project, which I'll come on to in just a second, is really about matching up um, resources and need about connecting the right people. It's a little bit cheesy to say, but so often problems are actually opportunities. And that's very much what we've experienced here. So uh, the situation that we have is an empty building, which used to be a, a set of diocesan offices, but which has been vacant for a few years when they moved out to an out of town venue. Um, and uh, we all know that sometimes buildings can be a drain on resources, so it looks like a problem in itself. But we also have an issue within the town of Blackburn, which is uh, that we are what is called a dispersal area for people who are in the asylum process. And there are some very, very specific housing needs around that. Often words such as refugees and asylum seekers get used interchangeably, but they're actually quite specific and their needs are different. And what we find here in Blackburn is that there are a group of people who have been through the asylum process and then they are granted refugee status. So they're able to remain here in the UK, but they lose all of their benefits and the housing which is provided and they have just four weeks to find somewhere to settle. 
that's the that's the real housing need that we find here in Blackburn. And so we felt uh, a Christian responsibility to respond to that. So again, it's, it's matching up those those two issues, our building, the need that's there. But also, crucially, this isn't something about doing a ministry to a community. This is about recognising that this is our community and we are part of it. Often with cathedrals, there are kind of strange assumptions about who goes to them um, and how grand they must be. It's not the case at all. Cathedrals are incredibly eclectic congregations, as many other churches are too. But a number of the people who worship here week by week day by day are people who have themselves either been through the asylum seeker process or who are in it at the moment so it's serving the needs of our own community and our learning from that I guess is mainly about perseverance um, it's about celebrating the connections which have already been made but it's also because we haven't yet finished about persisting in knocking on the doors even now so many thanks to Libshare for their support and I'll hand on to the next church. Thanks, Rowena. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm, I'm associate pastor at Hope Community Church in Bristol. And we sort of stumbled in, into uh, working with LiveShare um, because we've got a, a relatively modest parcel of land next door to the church. And we um, had, had begun, a few people begun to have an idea of whether we could build a single person dwelling on, on that parcel of land, affordable housing, for a targeted individual that we've been working with for over 10 years as a church to um who, who's come out of prison who's come out of addiction and and was homeless at one point and and we've worked with him he's now uh working for the church as a caretaker and, and we felt like now was the right time to look at trying to create affordable housing for him and longer term as part of our strategy for helping uh, marginalized people reintegrate meaningfully into society and giving them a helping hand to do that in the area of the city that we live uh, affordable housing is is totally uh, non-existent for uh, people coming out of prison or who who maybe would struggle to hold down a full-time job so um I was pointing in the direction of, of the uh, Innovative Built Solutions program and, and we put in a, an application and, and the LiveShare guys have really helped us to understand how plausible it is to do something meaningful, high quality, uh, even on quite a small bit of land and using modern methods of construction for, for us because um, access is very hard to the, to the bit of land that we're looking at. Uh, using a panelized system means that we can we can basically a bit like a flat pack, a flat pack home we can we can really make something through bringing it in without the need for cranes or for any really uh, high end uh, construction site and that was a game changer for us I think before then we'd sort of assumed that we wouldn't be able to do anything because of the restrictions of the site so we're looking at about 40 meters squared and um, because using those modern methods of construction, it, it should be carbon neutral, it should be high quality, it should be very low energy demanding and should be affordable. And I think uh, for us looking forward, because, because the, the occupant will be um, paying rent, the, the finance of it in, initially looked like a massive barrier, but actually, if you look at a way of, of attracting funding that you could pay off over a number of years, um, then it becomes very, very manageable and actually not a big initial outlay uh, for us as a church potentially we're still at the early stages still looking at um, the best way of getting the process done but our main learning I think uh, is that you know it, it's in many ways a small project and there's it could feel like it's insignificant but actually hearing others speak connecting with live share and the wider narrative I think it's it's about trying to play our part no matter how small no matter how small the land to try to contribute to the solution to this housing crisis wherever we can. So that would be our story and our learning points. So I'm Bill Bewley. I live in Keswick, which is in the northern end of the Lake District National Park. I got into uh, being involved with affordable housing because I was chairing a series of meetings that was organized by Churches Together in Keswick. We looked at the town council, we looked at the elderly, we looked at the youth, and we looked at how Keswick uh, related to the world we're in through environmental issues, fair trade and the like. And at every single meeting, the lack of affordable homes in Keswick came up as one of the main concerns. So at the end, like a fool, I said, oh, I lead a group that will look at that. And about 18 months later, we formed Keswick Community Housing Trust, 
And since we were formed, we our first project was 11 houses at the back of um, a Church of England church, St. John's, Keswick. It was an extension to a graveyard and it wasn't very suitable for burial, but it was perfectly suitable for houses. Um, we were delighted with the support we got from the Church of England because at times the local vicar had to speak to his trustees to remind them of the right that we as Christians have to provide homes for our community. Sometimes trustees Oh, Bill may have frozen. We'll just give um, it. Oh, get very concerned. This is, sorry. Keep going, Bill, you're back now. Okay. So anyway, with the encouragement of the local vicar, we built 11 houses. And since then we were given um, a disused toilet block, which we made into four flats. Then we bought 22 houses from a developer, which were all affordable. And our latest project, which is taking all my hair away, turning it gray, is four houses at the back of a Methodist church. It's not the Methodists that are giving me gray hairs, it's just uh, services and a whole lot of other things. So we have um, developed a site, we have uh, renovated a, a building, we bought houses from a developer, and we've demolished a church hall and rebuilt it. So we're pretty knowledgeable about the different forms of development. So maybe later on, you'll have a, a question for me. Um, I suppose the biggest lesson uh, I've learned or we have learned is perseverance because you do get setbacks, but there's always a way around a setback. Either you have to step, step uh, further back and then negotiate the difficulty or you can uh, speak to somebody and then a door opens. But you will get setbacks, but usually there's a way through. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panelists and thank you particularly for sticking to your very tight two to three minute time window. Really appreciate that. It gives us loads of time for Q&A. So just as a reminder, if you do have any burning questions, please do pop them in the chat box. And I'm going to start here with um, some of the questions that we've, we had previously. Um, Marvin, if I may come to you first, there's been a question about how, how do we get the support from local authorities? So um, thinking about local authorities more generally, as well as Bristol specifically, if, if a church wanted to do a project, how do they go about building those relationships with the local authority and getting their support? Well, I think sometimes that, that sounds more mysterious than it than it uh, is. I mean, I doubt there'll be some who will have, be suspicious of faith groups. That's just reality. I've been on the receiving end of it myself, being a Christian. But on the whole, local authorities want to build houses, and I think um, people who turn up with solutions um, will receive, um, you know, will receive an open hand. Certainly um, in Bristol, uh, that's been our approach. Um, that the church is turning up with solutions and resources and expertise and commitment. Fantastic. So we take them up on the offer. And I, and I, I, think, I, I think that there's a similar approach across the core cities, the 10 biggest cities across um, uh, the UK. Um, but I'm sure that, it, you know, if you have questions about, as, as I told you, get, you, you run into difficulties. If you have questions about how to bring a, 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 you know, a piece of land forward for development, um, talking to the authority early and, and just setting out the, the scale of the offer um, is a, is one way. But also in networks like this, there are people like Jez Sweetland and uh, um, uh, you know and the Bristol Housing Festival yourself as well, who can also come in and having been there and done that to support people bring their schemes to a place where they feel comfortable presenting them. Thanks so much. And uh, Rowena or, or Bill, Andrew, how has that been your experience or, or what has been your experience as you've engaged with local authorities? Perhaps Rowena, I could come to you first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, in many ways it, it's actually about building on um, a relationship of trust, which we've already got. 
and the, the sooner you can engage with your local authority and other partners, the better really over, over anything. Um, and as that relationship builds, then actually starting to talk about projects that, that you've got will be much easier and, and much more natural. Um, we've had great support from our, our local authority here in Blackburn with Darwin um, because uh, we're on the same page. We know what the needs are. They know what the, the needs are. So there's absolutely no, no conflict or, or mystery in this at all. Brilliant. Thank you. And Bill, any, any further comments from you? Uh, yes, I think it's absolutely essential to build up a good relation with uh, councillors. When we were first talking to our local town council, there was a certain suspicion as why should a group of amateurs get involved in quite a, a difficult uh, project. Uh, but very soon they realised, as has just been said, we're both on the same uh, page. We both want the same I think probably you need to be very sure that you demonstrate your desire to do something for the community, but you make sure you bring as many as possible with you. I've got to say that until our houses start to believe that we would ever do anything and would very much question why would a group uh, get involved in building houses. As soon as our first project was completed, is, is wonderful in the town and continues to be so. But it's very important to liaise with uh, local authorities. Thanks so much. Um, Graham, may I come to you? I, I've had a couple of questions um, that I'd like to direct your way if that's okay. The first is about how, why should churches bother if they've got a part of land why should they bother engaging with the idea of affordable housing or um, working with a local authority and alongside that if they wanted to what would be your best recommendation for how to get started yeah thanks jesse i think um i mean why do, why do we do this i mean i think as i was saying earlier on i mean one of the the um things is it's, it's one of the most urgent sort of social needs we have in our society at the moment i was talking with one of our vicars recently and was it was in a in a quite a sort of deprived area of london and he was saying how it's you know um almost all of the pastoral issues that he comes across in his parish have some connection with housing or poor housing you know, whether it's overcrowded housing whether it's sort of poor you know bad quality housing or people feeling unsafe in their homes uh, or families just not being able to kind of rest quietly because you know their homes aren't secure. There's so many of the kind of you know issues that people were having were actually related to the, the homes in which they live. You know, our homes make a massive impact upon our lives. And we're probably more aware of that than ever right now because we've been spending an awful lot of time in our homes uh, over the last year. You know, and we've, we've become very aware of how, you know, if you live in a nice, comfortable home, lockdown has not been too bad for you. If you live in a very small, tiny house and you're trying to kind of homeschool your children and it's crowded and there's no privacy, lockdown is a nightmare. And so our homes have a massive impact upon our lives. And therefore, it's, it seems to be such a crucial thing that the church, if we're interested in our communities uh, and the thriving of our, of our communities, we should get involved in them. And I think the other thing is this, this simple point that I, I do believe it's possible to... You know, as I was saying earlier on, to, to tell the story of the gospel in bricks and mortar. Actually, you know, that the, the houses that give people uh, a taste of, uh, of something that is sustainable, that actually, you know, it works with the environment, that is safe, a safe place where you can live, that's stable, enables people to put down roots in a community and feel part of it. And something that's sociable, enables people to kind of mix in together, invite their neighbours in, uh, and something that's actually satisfying. You, you, you come home to you and you enjoy it. That's part of God's will for us as human beings. Now that actually tells the story of the gospel from creation through to, to, to new creation. Um, if you want to know more about it, just check out the, the little Lamb Grove booklet. Um, and therefore, this is, you know, this is an integral way of telling the story, giving people a taste of a home that, um, that we're invited to uh, one day in the new creation where God makes his home with us. And so it seems to me this isn't something kind of, you know, to one side that, you know, this is just a, a marginal thing. It, it could be a, a fantastic way of engaging with our communities, meeting real social need and actually bearing witness to the gospel that is at the heart of the Christian faith. So those are some of the reasons why. Um, where you would start with it, um, I think one, one place I'd go to is, um, and we'll put the link in the, um, in the, uh, the chat in a moment, but we developed um, a whole series of blogs uh, as part of the commission, profiling a lot of different ways in which churches have got involved in 
housing need locally. It could be what Bill's talking about, using some church land uh, to develop affordable housing. It could be just becoming aware of housing need in your local area, um, having a drop in a place where people can come and uh, share their, their problems with housing and, and talk to, to, to people in the housing department of local, of local communities. Uh, it could be just uh, advocating uh, with, lo with local politicians for affordable housing uh, being a priority. There's lots of different ways in which that can be done. And so uh, first step, I'd say just check, it, check out these blogs, go through them and think, yeah, that could work for us. We could do that. And we'll put the, uh, the link in the, um, uh, in, the, in the chat in a moment. Thanks so much, Graham. Uh, so Rebecca, fo just following on from that, there's been a question that uh, says, we don't have any money, but we do have ideas and energy. So just <laughs> following on from what Graham has said, is there anything you would add in response to that in terms of how to get started? And who, who do you partner with if, if you don't have money, but you've got all that sure. ideas and energy? Yeah, I, I just think money doesn't necessarily need to be a problem. It sounds like, sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, but I think once you start putting things together, um, ideas become investable often. Um, if it was me starting from scratch, I would be looking at um, doing some research, understanding what needs are in my area. So often churches do know, but I think I would be talking to the people that are talking to others. So often local councillors, MPs, advice centres, that kind of thing, and really find out where the pain points are. Often they're connected to housing. So if you have a heart for housing, often you can see where the correlation is. But I would start, I would start there. And then start working up an idea about actually where does that where does the where do those pain points match with the resources that you might have? So is it a random bit of land? Is it an underused hall? Um, are you able to buy a house and so on? Um, and and work up a vision. I think a compelling vision for what you want to do and why you want to do it and the impact you want is inherently fundable. So being really clear about that from the outset is helpful. Sometimes having money at the start is unhelpful because it drives it drives the purpose more than the will. So yeah, don't give up just because there's no money. Brilliant. And you, you nicely touched on something there, which I'd like to take us off on a tangent into, if that's okay. Could I just say there? Oh, yes, go on, Bill. Yeah, uh, just to say, um, community shares is one very good way of getting money. We only raised £60,000 out of uh, Keswick but that released a one million pound um, building fund. So even a relatively small amount can make a huge difference when building affordable homes. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so just moving on slightly, and I'd like to pick up on a theme that's coming out in a couple of the questions, but also something that has been picked up by a number of our speakers so far, and it's thinking about the kind of the needs and the end user. Um, so Andrew, I'd love to come to you first, but you could, because you mentioned it specifically in yours, but how do you, obviously you had a very specific kind of end, end goal, if that makes sense, but how do you um, go about working out that that is the, that is the best use of that piece of land and it's the best person for that house or the best kind of um uh, what's the word i'm looking for the the best solution for for the particular problem that you have you've noticed if that makes sense and andrew after i've come to you marvin i'd love to come back to you as well and think about how do, how do people how do people really work out what is the best solution for the problem that they they see so andrew to you first please thanks jesse yeah so i, th I think for us um, it, this is a next step on a on a long journey of uh, of the church. I've only been at the church for two years, but for the 20 years that the church has been around, it's always had a drive to be working with people on the margins of society, helping people to to reintegrate meaningfully, to to um, give give them a community and a relational network to help scaffold them back into a independent way of life. And through that, one of the ways that the church has done this for 20 years is by trying to help encourage people back into employment by um, trying to pick specific bespoke projects in the church building that they can do. And through that, then we've been able to offer one or two um, jobs and through that. And that, so so I get what I'm trying to say is that it, it, we didn't start with the desire to house somebody. We start with the desire to make a meaningful impact on, on people's lives reintegrating into society and housing has become the obvious next step for us really because for this individual who's become right you know the life of the church is really central to their day-to-day -day life and affordable housing area is impossible it just seemed like a no-brainer to us but it wasn't where we started it's a fruit of 20 years of work thank you angie and marvin how do you 
how do you know when you when you're building affordable houses how do you know that you're meeting the right need how do you go about trying to make sure that you have a solution that really meets that need uh, you're on mute marvin that's Thank a bit you. more of a challenging in you know, my yeah for me to answer because i have such a helicopter view you know our commitment is to was to get the city building um, at least 2,000 homes a year, at least 800 of those affordable. Now, we've been hit quite hard by COVID and Brexit, so those numbers haven't uh, been met. But what has happened by having big numbers, we certainly focused minds and got lots of houses built, more than we would have if we'd set small targets. Um, so we'd have, we've had that, which ours has been about the helicopter views, but we've had, I, I guess what I could say is there have been some general principles um, that we what we've said is that we want to build mixed communities yeah so um ed rogri has been involved in a scheme uh, exactly with six different 10 years of housing so you, i was asked in cabinet today why don't you just make 100 percent of the homes affordable on this this big site i said well we don't necessarily want 100 percent affordable homes in one place of council houses right because you end up with a council house concentration but, you know we'd like some council houses next to some key worker houses next to market cell houses so we're getting mixed communities you get that internal mentoring rather than ghettos of people who can't afford to live in houses and then ghettos of people who can you know buy uh, big houses that takes some bravery because it means you know because the, the, the romantic line is 100 affordable so i guess in my sense of what the city needs is we operate with those 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 general principles um, and then it's up to, uh, but th that's on our delivery, but uh, and in our partnerships, but there are other people who are a lot closer to the ground who are getting real good things done that are about needs. So again, I mean, but you're involved. The Z pod scheme, for example, and I see Ben on the call as well from the, the YMCA, you know, 11 homes in a piece on a car park for young people at risk of, of homelessness that is meeting their need but that's with very local expertise with ben's expertise about what's going on for young people and the expertise of housing delivery i'm um, an appreciation from bristol housing festival the need to build community and it's all built into it so um, you have those broader systemic principles but with lo local expertise for specific um, housing developments as well as so about as close as i can get to there no, that's really helpful thank you thank you marvin um, so to move us on again, uh, in, onto a little slightly different tangent, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, there's, there's been a question about lack of land um, and how actually land is a, is a huge part of the issue when we come to look at affordable housing. Um, and the question is, how can the National Church release more buildings for land and for development? And from your perspective, having worked on this programme for the last little while and working with seven different churches um, mm. and linked to that, as, as well there's a question around is it is it only one denomination that's involved in this or is it is it across different churches so i'm going to leave you with those two rather oh, major sure. questions also oh, the your last question is the easiest one i think it's definitely about cross-denominational it's not you know it's not a church of england issue and the churches that are involved with us on the scheme um for the inevitable solutions weren't all church of england um but i think in terms of what the national church can do feels like a bit of a red herring i know that sounds really insane but i think it's about communities and being close to people that will benefit from things and actually i think that's where the power lies i think actually i think Local church leaders, people who have a role in the church and a voice can do something about that. I think the national church, it's a massive machine, isn't it? It's kind of trying, you know, you'd be doing land audits and la la la. And in the end, you still got to get the local people to do something about it and to understand what is a good solution. So for me, that's where it starts. I think it's all about community led approaches. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't look at national church. I would look locally and look at ourselves and what we can do. That's really helpful. So in, in terms of thinking more locally and thinking with the communities that exist around churches and church buildings, um, Rowena, may I come to you and just, and then follow um, that up with, with Bill and Andrew, but I'd, I'd love to hear about how you maybe got involved with the, lo how the local community got involved with your project or how you were able to engage them, if at all, even in, in the sense of kind of planning consultancies and that kind of thing. How, how did that look for you in your project? 
Yeah, thank you. So I think um, in many ways it, it sort of started a step back with the, the last question, but but one um, about sort of identifying the, the needs really. And it starts with hearing the stories, listening to the stories of the people who are actually on the ground. And um, that actually shapes understanding what the needs are and what the projects are. So, so in our very specific context, um, we're aware of where there is a housing need and equally, equally we're aware of what the housing need isn't. Um, so we know, for example, that here in Blackburn, um, uh, provision for um, street sleepers, uh, there is actually quite a lot of that provision. Now, you may say, well, it's, it's not ideal, you know, the provision that's there isn't, isn't great, but actually that, that is something where other groups are, are really targeting that issue. And so it wouldn't be helpful for us just to wade in and try and do that on a totally different, um, different tack. Um, but we know that there is a particular gap around uh, people who have recently um, uh, been given asylum status. We hear their stories. We hear the stories of, of people um, in the refugee uh, process or people who've been granted asylum um, who've ended up in houses in multiple occupation which aren't safe with unscrupulous landlords. Um, we listen to those stories and we listen to them respectfully. And as we hear those stories, we understand what, what the need is. So from that very basic grassroots level, it starts. And then actually it's been about developing partnerships um, with those individuals themselves, but also with the umbrella organizations that already work to support them. So in our context, working together um, both with um, housing associations and, and partnerships in that direction, but also with the people who provide day-to-day um, -day services, non-residential um, for those seeking asylum or who've been granted refugee status. So the Befriender projects, the English language projects, all of those, actually those are people who have a handle on the community and understand what the needs are and also with a view to supported living in, in the future. So it's lots of different levels. Bill, I saw you nodding along at points there. Was there something you wanted to add or anything you can share from your experience? Well, I think, um, yeah, that I would totally agree with that. I think local groups understand their own community. There is no one solution fits all. Um, is uh, a town where there's very low unemployment, but most of the jobs are hospitality or the retail industry, and so they are quite low paid. They're just above the, the minimum, uh, the legal minimum in many cases. So we worked out that in order to buy the average house in Keswick, you needed a family income of £70,000, which was beyond... Uh, Um, you know, the, the, the uh, ability of most people in Keswick. Um, so yes, I was in association to advise us on our first property, our first project. Um, and then in partner with them. So, but we control our allocation. We have our own allocation policy, which we do the interviewing and so on. Um, we didn't farm it out to a housing association. So I would certainly advocate that a local community land trust is the way forward. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Graham, coming back to you, thinking about the community, if, if somebody is um, an individual that happens to be part of a community or part of a, a community church, uh, their church might not be getting involved in a particular build project, but, but how does somebody as an individual get involved? How do they support this? How do they, if they're a particular Christian, how does that, how does that work for them? What, what's the best advice you could give an individual? Yeah, I think um, there's a number of things you could say. One is, um, well, we all, we all have a home, um, whether we own that home, whether we rent it, um, we have a home and we can think about how we use that home. And it might be some of us own more than one home. Uh, if you are a, a landlord, I think there is a real, that's a kind of Christian calling to kind of take care of a home, to, to, to look after it, to make sure that your tenants are well looked after, that the house is in good uh, condition. 
um, to actually see your ownership of a home as, a, as owning something which is given to us in trust. I mean, one of the things about a, a doctrine of creation tells us that nothing we have is ultimately ours anyway. Even if we're homeowners, we're, if you like, leased those things by God. We are the kind of tenants who look after them. And so I think that's, that's one thing. So if we own a home, uh, one thing that can be happening, you know, there, is, um, uh, there, there are charities like Night Stop, for example, that is a uh, do a brilliant job of, of enabling people just to take in uh, someone who's recently become homeless just for, for a night or two, uh, just to enable them to kind of get back on their feet and have a bit of respite. Um, my daughter has been involved in that, and, and, um, and that's, that's one example, simple example of how you can use your own home. If, you're a, if you own a second home, if you're a landlord, view that as part of your spiritual responsibility. And then the third thing is, I think, just getting, in, getting people in your church. It might be just a few handful of people in your church that could say, okay, can we find out what are the, what are the real kind of housing needs in our local area? And that might mean sort of knocking on some doors around the, around the local street, uh, local streets, just being able to ask people, you know, are there particular housing issues that you have here? Uh, maybe doing some research on your local area to work out what are the real kind of housing issues? What is it? Is it, is it rent um, that is too high? Is it, a, is it lack of affordability? Uh, is it um, overcrowding? Whatever that might be, and find something that you can do. Um, one of our churches, here has a fantastic example of a you know once every every week it's now developed into a huge um well they do a food bank for quite some time but, but they, they have a, a sort of drop-in center uh, they liaise with local with a local police li liaison officer mental health um support and housing officers from the local community so people can know they can drop in at three o'clock on a wednesday afternoon and they can get access to people who can give them advice on their housing and that again is a few few people in their local church thinking what can we do uh, about housing need in a local area so those are some of the things i think that can be done that's really helpful thank you graham um now we are making our way through our time quite quickly and i am shortly going to um point to each of our panelists and ask for any kind of final final thoughts, any sort of final statements you might have, any points you'd like to highlight or just kind of reiterate. But before we do that, we have a few more, we have a little more time for a couple more questions. And Rebecca, I'd like to come back to you, if I may, with a little bit more of the kind of practicals again. So um, look at a few questions that have come in um, around uh, what if we've got land and what's our kind of first step what do we what do we do how do we start thinking about what we do with it and how we use it um, and then alongside that there's another question around have there been examples of projects that have deliberately involved future tenants um, in their development of those solutions and obviously Andrew has one example of that that he may be able to add to but are there any other examples that that you know oh uh, sure so um uh, we'll, go to, we'll do the examples one first. I think Andrew's is a great example. Um, there are other projects where people who are working with people that would benefit from the accommodation have been involved, and that's quite common. Um, so Rowena's done that in Blackburn, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples, actually. Um, I can think of more ways to do it than examples that come to mind, because working with churches isn't something that we do every day. <laughs> so... Um, but it's entirely possible, I think, to run workshops that include people that may benefit from it. I think it can be slightly difficult to run it with people who are definitely going to benefit from it. It can be a bit divisive and it's hard to predict. Um, but community-led housing is a great example for that that Bill was referring to. Um, your first question about um, if a church has got a bit of land and where to start. Um, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I would really be looking at actually what are computers struggling with? How can that best be used? How can it best be shared? Um, oh, we may have lost Rebecca. Give a couple more seconds, see if she pops back. Well, whilst her internet is resetting, um, Andrew, can I come to you? Is there anything you wanted to add on your specific example? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's probably a bit easier for us in terms of that we we have an individual that we want to provide affordable housing for. Um, and so it's been very easy to involve him in the process and uh, design and what kind of housing would, would, would suit the individual. I think the one thing I would say is that... Um, in, in some senses, for us, we didn't start with a desire to, to, to 
enter into housing we started with a clear idea of what as a church we were driving towards we wanted to work with specific people groups and and specific uh, niches of the community and our our desire to enter housing follows that those individuals and i think i would just encourage that that um, housing is all about people and and in the local community there'll, there'll probably be more need than churches can meet and so make sure you have a clear i guess make sure you have a clear vision or, or that the housing that you want to be a part of creating aligns with a bigger bigger vision that the whole church is bought into that it's not something separate but it's actually core to the identity of what the church is about and and that hopefully will, will, will afford a greater buy-in and actually if the community knows that that's already part of your vision and you're active in it i think that will garner better support because that it makes sense that you would create housing for these kind of people because you're already working with them Brilliant. That's that's really that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one final question before I come to each of the panelists for a um, for a kind of sum up, if that makes sense. And then um, I'd love to come back to come back to you, Graham, and just ask from, from the, there's a question in the box there. Um, just how urgent is the problem from the view of the church from the and from the Archbishop of Canterbury's commission? Um, all things being equal, what would a proportional and measurable response be if the church centrally and churches individually responded in a timescale that's appropriate? So we're looking at, you know, how urgent really is the church view viewing, the England viewing the problem of the housing crisis? Well, I think a measurement of that is that um, the Archbishop of Canterbury decided that the first commission he wanted to set up was about housing. Um, he brought up, a, he, he wrote a book a number of years ago called um, um, uh, vision for Britain, which is a kind of an idea of what, what would Britain look like if shaped by the kind of values of Christian faith uh, that have been part of this nation for, for, for years. It's got a number of different ch chapters on a lot of different issues within our society. Uh, but the one he chose, you know, as, 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 the, as the first thing he wanted to address was, was to drill down into was precisely this one of housing. And that's, so that says something about his priorities. It also says something about our priorities as a uh, as a church, um, in the sense that I think what we what we will see, and, and you know, in, as the as the commission launches, is a is a particular emphasis upon this area, and it's an opportunity for us to explore it, to kind of take it seriously as a church. And I think, what would a proportional, measurable response be? Um, when we think about the church, we think about one thing, but of course, the church is many different things. Uh, it's the church commissioners on a kind of broad scale and the, the land and property that's owned by the church commissioners, individual dioceses. This is the Church of England, that is. And there's individual local churches. And of course, there are local churches of all kinds of denominations. And one thing we are quite well off on in, in the church in this country um, is buildings. We have got quite a bit of buildings and we have got quite a bit of land. And therefore, I think the challenge for us as a church is how do we use those buildings? How do we use those lands? Not just to keep our own show on the road. And not just to enable churches to, to you know, grow and to thrive. And yes, we need to do that. But how can we use them creatively to address one of the, the major crises in our nation that's affecting so many people around our country, which is precisely this housing crisis or the different housing crises that we find uh, across our country. So I think, I, I think what we're longing, longing to see at all those different levels, church commissioners levels, diocese level, local church levels, and even individual levels, you know, there's a, something for all of us to be involved in. I think just one more last thing I'd say, uh, we have, we've got our five values there, our sort of five S's, if you like, as to what good housing looks like. We, we've added a sixth S, which doesn't really describe housing, but it's something without which the housing crisis will not be solved, and that is sacrifice. And it, we know as Christians that, that you know, nothing, that, that, that resurrection doesn't come without death. Um, this will not come without sacrifice, and that sacrifice on behalf of everybody. At the moment, that sacrifice is paid largely by people at the receiving end of the housing crisis, those in unaffordable, unsuitable housing. Now, if we all share something of that sacrifice, landowners, developers, housing associations, government, whatever it might be, all of us uh, share that sacrifice, we can actually do something about this housing crisis. And I think part of the call on us as the church is to do the part we can. Uh, to set up those kind of prophetic signs, if you like, of the king, of the coming kingdom of God uh, in addressing housing need in our local areas. Yes, that's a really powerful. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, I'd like to just run around the panel uh, for any kind of final comments. Marvin, can I start with you? Just as, as we've been saying all night, just how central housing is to uh, to our country's future right for social justice and um, but also our planetary responsibilities it's worth bearing in mind as we lead into cop 26 in edinburgh at the end of this year when we're 
talking about having you know 10 years to get it right on climate and biodiversity species loss but again that the housing will very much underpin the physical shape and the systems that we require to run our cities and if we get it wrong um, it's going to be a problem because houses are with us for hundreds of years um, but therein is an incredible opportunity um, to bring forward housing and housing solutions that uh, that meet those challenges. Just something as well that I've repeated quite often that Graham said at the beginning, which I loved as one of the qualities. We have to. We can also contribute to the discussion about what housing is for, what it means. And I'll never forget just him pointing out that in a housing, you need to have the ability to be hospitable. Again, these are not just boxes. It, in its very nature, human dignity, forming human relationships. And I've shared that insight a number of times with uh, with developers and, and with housing officers and they love it when you just point that out there's so much more than just putting bricks on bricks or even you know mmc walls pinned to nmmc walls it's there's you're doing something that has meaning and and when i shared with developers just how much responsibility they had the, the scale of, of public leadership um that is now on their shoulders i think it was both a challenge but i i think it also was a lift to them to just think just you know not just evil developers coming in and running off with a profit but they have such a huge responsibility for shaping the way our cities and our towns work in the future thank you so much rebecca um i think the only thing i want to say is if there's a stirring in your gut about all this do something about it like use what your natural instincts are go research go volunteer go and speak to people go and hear what's going on and just immerse yourself in it and I think naturally then you start making the connections and finding ways to respond thank you Rowena I think that um, responding to housing needs is about doing something really transformative it's not a vanity project and because of that sometimes um, uh, there's a need to compromise or to change what you thought your original plan was going to be and that's not a problem that actually if you're flexible and you change as you understand the needs more and you understand the resources more then something even more transformative more exciting more helpful to people who really need it can happen thank you andrew yeah, I think something that I, I've really appreciated that's been shared and, and a really good reminder for me is how, how community is at the heart of housing. And I think as a church, we have such relational wealth when it comes to the community that we can form around people. And so obviously space has been mentioned that the church doesn't have much space. Well, we've got car parks. And so the Z-Pod scheme here in Bristol is a, a great way you can put housing above space. Um, a lot of church members have got big fat gardens, maybe even one or two. You could probably put a house in there again. Housing Festival have got some examples of where people have done that. So, But the main thing that the church has is a relational support network where you can actually create um, families away from families for people. It's not just creating homes. It is, as so many people say, creating communities. And, and we're in a very good place to do that if we're intentional and keep that as a priority as to why we're creating housing. Thank you. And Bill. Could I just give an example of uh, housing where uh, the people who work on the houses then become um, homeowners and that's LATCH, which leads action to create homes. And that's exactly what they do. They um, repair um, the shovel buildings and uh, make them a really good quality buildings. They give training to people who could be out of work or in poorly paid jobs, they become carpenters, plasters, electricians, and so on. And then they can apply for the house that they've renovated. A really good scheme. Um, and then back to me, I think um, I'm not entirely happy with the Bishop's mention of sacrifice, because I think one of the things I would say about getting involved in affordable housing is how rewarding it can be. I worked in production, uh, bakery production management all my life. I've been um, in fantastic places. I worked in Dublin, in Liverpool, here in Keswick, and even in the Caribbean for nearly seven years. And some of those jobs were extremely well paid. But the most rewarding job I have ever had is being chairman of Keswick Community Housing Trust. So, so yes, there may be sacrifice, but I think there's tremendous reward in getting involved in trying to provide affordable home, homes. 
I would just like to say, yes, houses are a human need, but I think a basic affordable house is a human right, not just a human need. It's a right of everybody in this country to have a proper affordable home. Thank you, Bill. If only we'd got to that point sooner, we could have a good kind of chew on, on some of those points. It could have been quite fun. But we are at eight o'clock. So I want to start by thank you, thanking the panellists so much for your time, for your energy, for your engagement in this. I think that this is a real opportunity to celebrate some stuff going on around this around this country that is phenomenal and is um, a real kind of uh, it, it's a real exemplar of where collaboration is starting to solve a need that we see in this nation um, and and it's it's a real yeah I, I'm really privileged to be part of this event and I'm really privileged to be aware of what's going on here so thank you so much to the panelists if anyone else wants any kind of further information do check out um, the link in the chat that is going to go up very shortly around the housing justice website says there will be more information on there that you can look at so at this point in the evening um, i'm just trying to ignore all the football chat going on in the chat boxes but at this point in the evening we are opening up into breakout rooms and as i said at the beginning i would like to encourage all of you to um, take a moment to join a breakout room and have a conversation about what can you do and what can my church do in the face of some of the things that we've discussed this evening? What what can you do? What can my church do? Um, as I said, each breakout room will have a facilitator, either from the panel or from a church that's going through the programme or an organ a partner organisation of the programme. Um, so there will be some, some great people in the breakout rooms to go and talk to. So in a few moments, you are going to have an invitation to a breakout room on your pop up on your screen. Um, but before that happens, I just want to say thank you to the panelists again. Thank you so much to all those different organizations that have um, pulled together to pull this event together, including the um, the All Churches Trust. Um, and also thank you so much to all of you for coming along and engaging and asking such great questions. We haven't been able to get through all of them. I'm very aware of that. But if you do have a burning question, you can get in touch with us at the Bristol Housing Festival and we can get it to the right people. If you search us on the website, there's a kind of a general email you can send it to and we can get it to the right person. Um, or if you have another contact with anyone on the panel, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer your questions. But for now, Thank you so much. And I really do hope you enjoy your breakout rooms. Um, if you aren't joining a breakout room, please do feel free to just leave from here. But thank you so much for your time this evening. It has been an absolute pleasure.